The other thing is I've, I've looked at this pencil and I'm like, I make a living with this thing. That is yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, in this uh, inspiring hero series, uh, this is where I, I, I reach out to the most insp inspiring people in the industry and I get them to talk about their expertise. And in this particular case, we're going to be talking about the sketchbook and the importance of the sketchbook. And uh, when you think about the most important aspect of becoming a, a fantastic, a great artist and, and elevating your work to the next level, it doesn't necessarily take place in school. School is where they give you information, yeah. but, it, but it takes place in your own personal time. And, and what you do within the pages of your sketchbook. And here to talk about one of the most uh, uh, essential aspects of an artist's personal development, the sketchbook. I want you to please welcome Mr. Thomas Fluardi. <laughs> Dude, I'm a huge fan of yours, Marcelo. Anyway, so. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and just jump right in at the, to the, your resume. It is amazing. Oh. So uh, in terms of your professional experience, you have been featured on the covers for Mad Magazine, which is for artists, th that is <laughs> all the way up there. Yeah. There's Spiegel, Time Magazine, The Weekly Standard, People Magazine, Entertainment Weekly, Sports Illustrated. It goes on and on. The Village Voice, uh, Coca-Cola, The New York Times, yeah, Disney. Right. When, when I think of uh, artists that that have made it uh, with a resume like that, you've made it. How does that feel? You know, because there are artists out there that are always wondering, oh, if I could just be like Thomas, you know, I will have made it. So explain to them, what yeah. does that feel like? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, one, I was somewhere and they, 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 I think I was in Germany and doing something over there and they read uh, things that have happened for me these magazines and things. And it, it kind of shook me because I was like, wow, I never really stopped to really think and hear it read off like that. And yet for most of those, I was still trying to find myself. I, 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 never, I, never, I never have arrived is my point. And yeah, those are things that, that uh, sort of uh, sound successful, but really so much of my career was trying to get noticed, trying to do it. And then it was happening. It was like the New York Times would call me and I'd do something and be like, wow, this is crazy. Then I always felt like I, I was an illustrator in my mind, right? And what I mean by that is I wasn't trained classically. I was, I was, uh, I went to art school, like you said, and, and I had um, like an intuitive sense about my skill. And I, I cut my teeth on caricature from uh, 96, which was the very first uh, job with Mad Magazine, the cover, which was a, a gigantic uh, break. And that was my first uh, editorial job. And that's still to this day that boggles my mind that they gave me that cover. The, the interesting thing is I wasn't their first choice. And so it used to bother me for many years. And I was ashamed that I was never really the first choice of even Time Magazine. And I was second. And so it was like, it bothered me. And then when I realized that the Zinni in The Princess Bride was not the first uh, guy, it was Danny DeVito that was the first choice. When, when Wallace Shawn came in, he kept thinking Rob Reiner was gonna fire him every day. And they were like, Rob, I mean, they were like, Wallace, you're unbelievable. You've got the job, don't worry about it. And so he never really felt like he was yeah. like, um, he was in, like he, he yeah. felt like he was second. Oh, now that I look back, I'm grateful for those opportunities. And when they did present themselves, they say uh, uh, something about, um, you know, success is uh, having up and when opportunity shows up, you deliver. And so thankfully in those moments I delivered and the, the, the time cover, I only had 12 hours to pull that thing off and it was just crazy. But all I'm getting at is from 96 to, um, to 2004, 
um, there were, I cut my teeth on caricature and along the way I made it into shows and stuff, but I really didn't figure out what I was doing and wanting to say until like, you know, 96 to 2004. And around 2004, I got rejected at Der Spiegel and the art directors, I did a cover for them. And, and, and Stefan Kiefer, who's a great art director said, Tom, we couldn't use your cover because it was too freaky. It was too weird. And he goes, like, let me give you a hint. If you turn your, turn your work down so it's not so weird and freaky, we have, a, we have a, a conservative client base, you will get more work. And at that point, I, had, I took a George Bush that I did and I made it rather portraitive and I painted it. And then I designed a body based off of shapes. And that actually blew up in the sense that I figured out this is what I want to do and say. So it was through rejection, through not getting on the cover, through being corrected that I was able to receive it, uh, really think about how to make adjustments, sort of like at halftime, you know, you're, you're losing, you go into the locker room, you make adjustments, you come back out, that kind of a thing. But it was a whole big journey of uh, really learning caricature because I started caricature in 92. Um, and practiced for three years, took it to MAD, they rejected it, but they were cool about, they were kind, do more stuff a la MAD. Came back two years later, my friend Kevin Sackler said, Flu, take your work over there. I said, ah, they're just going to reject me. And they didn't, they gave me the cover, which was crazy. So, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's yeah. a bizarre thing, but I never gave up on caricature. I, I still love it to this day. I just don't do it for magazines. So what you're saying is that you never really thought about having Meg. You were so busy working that, that it's only in hindsight that you look back, that you see this body of work and you're thinking, oh, I, I guess I did do those things. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is, Marcelo, it's like um, when, I, when I got classically trained around 2003, they started teaching me stuff like form, value. I, I couldn't even explain value to, to you. I was an illustrator, but I was, I was just solving problems based off of, you know, magazine work. But what happened was what really is underneath all of this, all of my drawing is 35 years of storyboards. I, I, people don't even realize I'm a sequential artist. I'm a storyteller because I did storyboards for 35 stinking years and got jerked around like crazy in advertising all the art directors for 35 years. And so you're drawing from the ground up, you know, you're, you're drawing a, ch a mom in a kitchen and you're drawing a kitchen and you're drawing her standing on the ground on a grid. And then the little girl's cute. She's, uh, she's, um, you know, she's uh, whatever, you know, she's ethnic. And so you're, you're just drawing all this for 35 years. That's, that's really what, has got me to this level mileage as i've pressed in now in 2015 i started really discovering i love drawing more than anything and i i know i started paid attention somebody said oh man i really love your drawings and then somebody else posted something i think it was bobby chu at 2012 Com comic con they put a uh, tom hanks drawing up and i looked at it and i said wow that's really cool and my other friends had already commented on it, but I paid attention that what really appealed to people were my drawings and not so much my paintings. So I'm developing as a painter all the time. It's, it's my, my number one goal. But, but in 2015, I stopped doing storyboards and I really went after drawing intensely and, sh and, and, and kind of like shooting free throws every day. You know, like I want to draw in a certain way so that's my pursuit now for the last seven years. And um, it, just the way it all happened was it, it's rather a disciplined approach. Boy, it's really taken off for you. 2012 Comic-Con, is that the year we met? Was that the first year? Yeah, I introduced, <laughs> I came up to you. I was like, dude, you're such a rock star. Because I, uh, I love Hotel Transylvania. I introduced my two daughters to you. Yes. And I was telling them all along, yeah, yeah, we're going to go meet Marcelo. He's a rock star. So yeah, it was great. It was great to meet you. And you're such a humble guy. But your work, I remember, I remember when I discovered it, I was like, I was like, I don't cuss. I mean, I do cuss from time to time. But I was like, shit, this guy's awesome. <laughs> you know, I was like, this is freaking awesome. Like, I just saw, I, I, my friend called me. I think it was Gary Locke. Gary Locke called me and says, dude, 
you got to look at Marcelo Vignali's work. I was like, I never heard of him. I looked at your work. I was like, this was back in the day of blogs. Yeah. And I was like, oh my goodness, this guy's freaking awesome. So I began it that day. And, and it was cool when I finally got to meet you, you know? Yeah. Well, the feeling is mutual because absolutely love your work and, Thank and the you. industry loves your work. As far as your awards go, uh, you received a national recognition from the Society of Illustrators and Communication Arts uh, Illustration Annuals. You won a gold medal at the yeah. Spectrum uh, Fantastic Art, uh, uh, from the Spectrum Fantastic Art, a bronze medal for the uh, cover painting of Max Lucado's book. Uh, and then also in 2018, you were awarded the Sokol Prize for digital caricature, critical uh, yeah. drawing and satire. And yeah. for those that are, are uh, unaware that uh, this award is named after Eric Sokol, the famed yeah. Playboy magazine illustrator. Yeah, right. and, and then it also, um, that, that your work is also in the personal collections of pioneer astronaut and American hero, uh, Senator yeah. John Glenn, musicians Pat Boone, Naomi Judd, and comic book legend Mike Mignola. You got to tell us about that <laughs> one. That's the creator of Hellboy. Yeah. as well as the uh, the late great movie director Robert Altman maybe that was through storyboards that was uh, that was a, a painting I did for Boston magazine back I don't know maybe it was like 90, 1998 you know and uh, I, he reached out to me and I, and I sold it to him and um, then he died I think he died a number of years later yes yes he did but what about the mike mignola what what does mike mignola what artwork does he have of yours he uh he's he's first of all i i love mike i i know him just barely we uh we i started drawing hellboy and, and that was the very first blue line drawing that i ever did i i found that pencil in a box one night i said wow i made a mark i said wow that looks like animation Woke up in the morning, I grabbed Hellboy and did a drawing of Hellboy. I put it up in the blue line stuff. And it, it just it just freaking like struck a nerve and everyone loved this drawing. And then like, I think somehow he he shot me a friend request on Facebook. And I was like, oh my gosh, Mike, Mike Mignola uh, sent me a Facebook request. And I was like, that's crazy. Cause I love, I love his drawings. And actually I own one and we trade it. But anyways, uh, he started sharing my work and I was like, dang, that's crazy. And then when we were at 2018 um, in um, at Lightbox, he came up to me and he said, you were actually on the short list of some of the artists I wanted to introduce myself to. And I was like, dude, I'm not worthy. You're, you're incredible. <laughs> and so we just kind of became friends. And, and, um, and I think he may have bought a drawing. I don't know if he did or I gave it to him. I can't remember. But then I did a drawing of he and uh, Peter DeSev from the back view. And they were looking, uh, it was a shot taken. And that thing took off when it got, when I posted it, it's a really cool back view of them. It's one of my favorite drawings. And then Peter reached out to me and said, hey, I'd like to buy that for Mike. I said, no, nah, I'm just gonna give it to him. So I gave him the drawing cause I just, I love Mike. Yeah. And then I did a drawing also of these two little kids back view uh drawing uh hellboy um i don't know if you've seen it it's a it's a they're drawing a uh like a like the mona lisa in a big frame but it's actually um it's hellboy in a museum and they're drawing and i'll send it to you it's, it's pretty okay. All crazy right. yeah. Yeah. and so then they bought that at the copra gallery uh there was a show i was invited into the 25 years of hellboy and um and then i went out there and then he and uh, Christine, his wife, were there at the show and we hung out and then they bought the painting. I was so on. I mean, the uh, drawing, they yeah, bought the drawings. The drawing. I was just so honored. I mean, they're the real deal. I mean, Mike is a, I think he's a genius. I, I really do. The character, if you draw Hellboy at all and you really start looking at this character, he's just freaking cool. Oh, it you know, is like, really, really well designed. I, I've been such a yeah. fan of, of Mike's for a long time and, and that character that he created, absolute gold. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, personally, uh, I know that you're a man of faith. That was one of the things yeah. that we talked about when when we met. And yeah. uh, and I know that your faith uh, plays into the development of your talent and your success. Can you describe that? You know, like what the, the importance of your faith and your professionalism? Yeah, yeah, totally. So I I became a believer. I became a Christian on the way to get more stoned and to get dr more drunk. 
And I was open. I was like, Jesus, if you're really there, change my life. Just don't make me religious because I didn't want to be religious. <laughs> yeah. And religion to me is, is silly. But yeah. and it also coming out of Ohio, it was a straw hat and, uh, and a leisure suit. That was the last thing I wanted. You know what? And you and me both, because, you know, I, I grew up without any faith. You know, and yeah, me too. I, I came to, uh, I had my come into Jesus moment uh, later in life, much later. Yeah. And it was actually, um, uh, that was one of the, it was a concern, right? I, I don't like religious people. I don't like them. Yeah, totally. totally. <laughs> but I, I wanted, I yearned to have this relationship with God, with, with, That's our, it. you know, with my creator. And it's interesting that you, you actually had ex almost the exact same reaction that I had. Yeah. So I was going to get a beer. I was stoned and I was high and I was going to get a beer in New York City. I was hanging out in Washington Square Park. I went over to get a beer. And as I was going over to get a beer, people were Jews for Jesus for standing on the street corner, handing out tracks. And I just stopped and asked them a bunch of questions. I had already been praying, God, if you're there, change my life. Just don't make me religious. Anyways, the, 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 the two people said, you know, they answered all my questions. And I was like, they were like, you, you want to ask Jesus into your heart? And I was like, yeah. And so I prayed and and confess my sins you know I, I knew I was a sinner um and then so when I opened my eyes this was the Saturday night like 11 30 at night I uh I I I the dude just came across the street gave me his bible was like dude I just became a believer three months ago my friends all think I'm crazy man here's my bible and he and I go okay cool so I took his bible and I went home and uh I didn't go get that beer and my whole life just completely just changed, completely blew up. Like I had incredible peace and joy and it was unbelievable a relationship that happened on that evening in July 4th, uh, July 7th, 1984. And it, it completely rocked my world. And uh, he changed, I was changed at that time. So, and I was, I was an artist. I was working at Gem Studio under Ken Bald at that time. And, and I worked at Gem Studio doing storyboards. And I worked there for a whole nother 13 years. But when I became a believer, it was like, um, uh, it, it, it was like art was so awesome. And it still is. It just, it just was something I had to figure out how not to make it number one. And so that was a tricky thing. And it, and it, and, and it just can't, it can't occupy number one in my life because it doesn't fully deliver. That's the yeah, point. That's if I were to, if I were to forsake my family and my daughter came up to me and I'm working and she said, Hey, Papa, and I get the heck out of here, kid. Can't you see I'm making a painting? <laughs> you know, like if that was my, my yeah. temperament, I'd be the loneliest man yeah. uh, receiving an award, or I'd be the yeah. loneliest man at a show. That would that would suck. Mm -hmm. So it's the it's the it's the it's putting art in the right place for me. And I believe you probably feel the same way. It's when it's in context, then I'm excited to come back to it. But if I serve it and and don't spend time with my wife or don't go to do whatever, and I just give myself to working and creating and, and, and receiving praise or likes or whatever, or whatever it is, ultimately it's like, I, I, um, I thirst more for those temporary, um, I'll call them shallow things. I think they could be good things, but they just don't, they don't fully satisfy me in context art does satisfy and I freaking love creating, you know? Yeah. So I'm just saying all of that as, as I've sought to, to live my life and seek God and just say, God, I, I really don't understand what you're doing in the world today. I, I don't understand much. All I know is that I'm known by you. You changed my life. I want to love people. I want to love my friends. I don't, I don't want to hammer people like I used to hammer people. I was a self-righteous idiot. And so now it's just like, hey, if I can get to know my, I have friends all over the, the uh, perspectives, you know, and it's just like, I want to, I want to hang out with them and know them and get to know their lives. So it's just been this crazy cool thing of, of um, basically not put, shoving it down somebody's throat and respecting where they are. And if they want to know, they'll ask me. And it's, it's just it's such a cool thing to actually be alive in this day and go to these shows and 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 my one friend uh he got in a really weak spot a broken spot and he reached out to me and he said he's not even a believer and he just said would you pray for me and i was like that is so cool you know and I, and this is one of my dear friends 
And I'm like, wow, this is incredible. And I'm not trying to shove anything down his throat, but he was broken enough to say, would you pray for me? And that was just cool. So all that to say is I love creating and I love asking God to help me understand. And that's really, I think, if I'm learning things, it's because, first of all, I'm studying with great people. I study with great artists because they're, they're better than me and I need to know things. And then I also ask God, I'm like, would, would you help me understand this, you know? Yeah. So uh, it's cool. That is, uh, that is so essential. Uh, I found that also with just a, a great sense of peace that once I accepted uh, the Lord, that yeah. just, I had this, I, I'm sure a lot of artists uh, struggle with this, is sort of all-consuming, all, I mean, because uh, art consumes you. Totally, yeah. And, um, and, it's who and, we are. Yeah, it's who we are. It's, it consumed every waking moment and, and everything. And that when I when I had my coming to Jesus moment, there, there was a level of peace that that I was given. And and that actually, it, it helps you be a more complete artist. Yeah, I think what so. you do is that you you pull yourself out and you start paying attention to the world around you, start paying yeah. attention to the people around you. you right. You allow that opportunity for the world around you to, to yeah. take a breath. And, uh, and then also the, the, uh, your family, just to appreciate your family, which is yeah. what you were talking about. Now, how, how do you balance that? Because it went with all of the accolades that you have, all of, yeah. uh, all of the work that you have, and, and, um, and you also, you have five daughters. How do right. you balance right. that and your, uh, and your work life? Um, for, okay, so just to be clear, I actually worked my life away. I, I worked, uh, I was providing, I've got five daughters, we had yeah. a swimming pool, we're paying for music, I was paying for uh, uh, gymnastics, you know, like, it was insane. Yeah. And storyboards, you can make a lot of money, but you got to give away uh, all your margins. So yeah. it would be, and I was doing editorial as well. So I gave away my life in my 30s and 40s. And, and, and now I'm 59 now. So uh, seven years ago, I got to a place where I just said, I'm done with storyboards. I'm no longer going to be under the pressure of this is due tomorrow. This is due tomorrow. This is due tomorrow. And it's like, I just have to stop. I was going to a birthday party. I was going out to dinner with my wife and my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law. Oh, I, I can't go now. I got to work. I got, I got 15 frames due in the morning. And then I'd stay up all night and make four grand and I'd just be completely shot. And I had four grand, but who, who, who cares, right? But I'm saying, as I, as I set up my life and the way I make money with diversifying, I teach a schoolism, I engage people on social media, I create books, I create prints, um, I, I teach, I do all kinds of things to, to diversify and make money in about four or five different ways. So that balance has come now because um, I don't have to do storyboards. And I don't have to really worry anymore, even though sometimes I do worry. But now I'm at a place where I'm like, God, you know what I need. And you know how this is going to happen. And I can't make it happen. I can work and do my homework. But in, unless you open that door, I can't make it open. And so I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to start a, a, a brand. Uh, the, the 901 Indigo Blue brand uh, is just putting my stuff on stuff. So I've been, I've been learning licensing for the last seven years. I went to shows. I talked to people doing it. We're just getting ready to start um, uh, the Tommy Flew Indigo Blue. And that could be a moneymaker. So it's one of my many, you know, few things, right? So all that to say is I, 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 I sort of, I, get, I try to get up early. I try to set the alarm for 545, you know, get up, have my quiet time, drink my coffee, kind of ease in. I just draw for a while. I just draw what I really want to until, until if it's a, a job that I must start, then I start when I absolutely must. But I'm always drawing and creating fresh. And I'm always thinking about where I want to go. And there's different reasons why I'm drawing what I'm drawing. It's always connected to something. It's never just to get likes. Anyways, I draw uh, and then I, we, I eat lunch. And then around 6.30, uh, we stop. I stop. And... Um, go in and eat dinner with my wife. We watched the wheel of fortune and <laughs> sound old. Right. And, uh, 
And then we go for a walk with the dog and uh, everybody's moved away. So, you know, like uh, we're in the empty nest now. So yeah. it's easier. So so if I, if I have to come back in and do some stuff, I will around eight, maybe nine and work till 10. Yeah. And then and then uh, try to get to bed somewhere around 1030, 1130 at the latest. Yeah. And that's it. I get rest. My point is to get seven hours guaranteed yeah. no no doubt because yeah. if i can be rested i can create really wonderfully you know what i'm saying yeah. yeah so that it's like strength i'm creating out of strength and if i'm tired and things aren't happening i just shut it down and say no i need i need a fresh eye i'm gonna get up early and i'm gonna draw you know yeah yeah the uh but you actually bring up a really good point uh and this is the unsung hero of uh, of an artist's life, and this is the artist's spouse. Exactly, dude. Uh, and uh, how how important? Because I know that Sherry, what she does is that uh, in order for me to score those touchdowns, she's the person that runs interference. Yeah, you know, to yeah, try yeah. to allow these things to happen. Yeah. So sometimes she knows I'm on a deadline, or she knows I'm working on something. Yeah. That she's the one that takes care of all these other things, and yep. it really is a partnership. Uh, and and yeah. how how long have you and Christy been married? 33 years coming up on 30 years, years. Wow. yeah wow. that's what yeah, congratulations crazy. yeah thank you and how long you guys been married uh we we've been married i think it's it's 35 this year and uh we've been together for 40 it'll be 40 years in a month so thank you that's awesome yeah it's it's really that's wonderful crazy. but uh, can you wow. talk a little bit about that like uh the kind of temperament that your wife has, the, the kind of person that she is in supporting you. Because I, I think that's another element that I think a lot of yeah. people don't really uh, understand or appreciate the importance of yeah. finding the right person, especially for an artist. Yeah. Yeah. So she put up with a bunch of crap from me. And, and meaning uh, when I wanted to be an illustrator and I wanted to be known and I wanted to be famous because I wanted work, I was so discontented with storyboards that I whined for years, you know? Oh, when, 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 and I'm just, I'm just a complete mess of just whininess, right? And so she, she was very gracious to me. And um, she, um, she's put up with me, you know what I mean? And she, she's totally put up with me for, for all this time. Her name is Christy. And she just, first of all, she raised she raised um, the girls and and uh, and uh, and homeschooled them. You know what I mean. So she, she raised the girls, homeschooled them, and that, and she she pays the bills. I don't really look at the bills. I know about what things are, but really she does. She she takes so much off my plate, so that it's kind of like all I really need to do is do art. And then I also get involved in parenting and, and things like that. It's not like I'm just doing art and she's taking care of, of uh, all these major decisions. Like I have to lead and, and help her and take care of her in the sense that to care for her, yeah. those, those kinds of things. It's, it, but she's, she's, she's allowing me and she has allowed me to free me up. So it's like, you know, there is no self-made man. You, you know what I'm saying? Like there is no like, I did this on the self-made man. No, you're not. Your wife is probably a bigger part of the picture than you are, you know? Yeah, yeah, it, it really is a team. And sometimes I hear uh, about some couples, we, we even saw it with uh, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, the importance, you can take a guy with a tremendous amount of success, but you yeah. team up with the wrong person. Yeah. All of that can just come just crumbling down. Uh, yeah versus you know you you partner with the right person yeah, that that right. you you actually can do really well because you start to function together as a team yep. yeah yeah that, that's yeah exactly and, right. and and this brings us to the 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 sketchbook and the importance of the sketchbook nice. um when i and, and it's interesting you talk about me in, uh, in advertising and, and doing all the storyboards and everything because i really do think that it it is so much a game of pencil mileage you need yeah to get dude that's that, totally it that that's a great word mileage. and yeah, uh totally the um and so when i when i think of what you've done just you're, you're sort of like one of the premier draftsmen of our age i don't want to i want to oversell you at all i honestly believe that's it. gigantic Thank and you. and I, I, and I, a lot I, of that I, is yeah. that uh it 
it's your perseverance and it's and it's the opportunities that you your talent has created but but that you've been able to do this and i remember um hearing um uh, glenn keen glenn keen he ended up saying that the pencil was a seismograph to the soul and i thought yeah. that was interesting that's, a that's description really of it cool. when i think of the, the pencil it really is sort of an underrated tool how would you describe the pencil yeah, that's a, that's a really good. That's a fantastic question. Um, the I yeah, I mean, I I think anything I say would sound cheesy. <laughs> but you know what? Be cheesy. It's it's Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant made a poem about his basketball. To us, it's a ball. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I understand. A basketball, a volleyball. Eh, it's just a ball. But to him, it meant something. Right. And to us, yeah. the school, something so simple, so rudimentary. Yeah can, can yeah. be so fundamental to us. And, and you've taken this, this particular tool and have done something exceptional yeah. with it. What does it mean to you? Yeah, um, well, thank you, first of all. That's, that's gigantic coming from you. Um, I, it's really an extension. It's an extension of, of all of my th thinking and all of my thoughts and all of the way I'm wired and it's an extension of trying to communicate. Like that's like I'm a visual communicator. That's my degree. It's a stupid two two year degree, but it was visual communication. So I'm a communicator with words. And it's actually funny because I led worship for a while, and I used to drive people nuts. And because I I can't say things as well as I can draw. And I asked this really dear friend. I said, well, I got in an argument with someone. I said. You you heard the conversation. What what happened there? Am I at fault? I fault. She goes, Tom. Let's just say you can make you communicate better with with words with with pictures rather than words. <laughs> and I was like, that's incredible. You know, like yeah. like I am an image maker. That's my job is to make an image. The other thing is I've I've looked at this pencil and I'm like, I make a living with this thing. Yeah. That is the most weirdest thing. And the other thing I've come to conclude that, and I don't mean that any of that arrogant, I'm just saying these are conclusions. I am this before I'm a paintbrush. And it's like, I have 40 years of this. Yeah. And the last seven, I've been pressing in so hard to draw in a very specific way because it's my thinking and all of the... Uh, the the observations I've been make, making that I'm trying to get them out onto paper and and I was thinking about this all oh, because this this is gonna sound really arrogant but please don't don't <laughs> take this as arrogant it's it's easy to draw for me it's easy to draw and what I mean by that it's not easy to paint it's easy to draw because I've been doing it for 40 years the, the difficulty isn't that I can't draw one day. The difficulty is that my taste is so refined. It's so, it's, it's been so tweaked and, and amped and, and trained into such a hyper place that if I don't do those thoughts I have, I, I bail on it and start again. You see what I mean? So it's like, it's more than when I can't draw, it's not that I can't draw, it's that I can't, I can't match my taste. Yeah. I wanted to clarify something. Like I, I, I said that drawing comes easy to me. And what I mean by that is I have this realization that if I'm drawing a lot, um, I get in a groove and you, I know you've done this where it just, you're flowing and it's, it's happening and you could just, those are the days when you're hot and you just go, wow, this is freaking cool. And then, you know, if you don't draw for a day, you might come back and, you know, you can still draw a level, but it just doesn't flow the same. And I, I had this realization the other day, a couple of weeks ago, where I was like, wow, it's easy to me. And I'm very aware of that. That's not a brag. It's not arrogant at all. What I wanted to say is because I'm aware of it, it's only because I've done it for 40 years, more than anything, more than painting. And I'm also pressing in extremely hard to draw in a very specific way with exaggeration and classical education mixed together. But I also have had this realization that I said, will I always be able to make the throw to first? I don't know. 
And I, that's where I'm needy and I'm dependent on God. What I mean is, what I'm what it, to clarify that is Chuck Knobloch was a golden glove. I'm not equating myself with Chuck Knobloch as a golden glove guy. He was a golden glove shortstop. Three, get the ball, bam, throw him out. I wasn't even thinking about throwing. He just threw the ball, freaking threw him out all the time. All of a sudden, he missed the throw and his head got messed with and he couldn't make the throw to first anymore. And he started trying to make the, the throw to first. And he he fell apart. And then I think he went to the Yankees and he they, they couldn't they couldn't get him. He couldn't get it back. Right. And so my question and one of my concerns is, will I always be able to make the throw to first? And that's something I'm very aware of that I, I tread lightly with this stuff because I, I realize it is a gift. I don't take it for granted. Um, I realize that that God has blessed me with an ability to think and create and be inspired and work through doubt, and all that stuff. But but it feels good right now. It yeah. may not always be there. Yeah, so I think that's a that's a great way to put it. You know, I, I the the answer to your question is no. You will not always be able to throw to first. There will right. come a day, <laughs> right? It will be taken away from you. It'll be taken away from me. And um, but here's the wonderful thing is that we get to hold it for a while. And it's sort of like the talent right. doesn't really belong to us. We just we just get yeah. to, uh, we just get to hold it for a little while. And, yeah. and then it's in, uh, yeah. this is why it's so important. What are you going to do with this while you have it? You, yeah. You've been given this yeah. this gift. You've been given yeah. the opportunity to hold on to this gift for for yeah. a short while. When you yeah. think of like um uh, I was talking to uh, a, one a Disney legend, John Hench, and I was asking him, well, you know, uh, like when when do you hit like your groove? When when do you uh, are you complete as an artist? <clears throat> and he said it happens uh, from 50 to about 70. Wow. That's actually when you're doing your best work. That's I think that's true. And and he said that after you hit uh, after 70 he said, all of the knowledge is there, all of the drive, all of the experience, everything is there. He said, but your energy starts to wane. Your concentration starts to wane. So you'll start noticing little, little bits of like disruptions in your concentration. Because uh, he, he was already in his like uh, mid 80s coming up on 90 when he was telling me this. So we, so we have about a 20, if we're lucky to get there, we have about a 20 year window yeah. where, where we, we get to do things, special yeah. things with this talent. And then it's taken away from us and it's given to the next person. <laughs> right. And that's the one, that's the wonderful thing about it. We, we get this chance to hold it and it's a special, it's a special privilege. And so when I, I and I, I had this question reserved for later, um, but, but seeing how we're already on this topic of, of, holding the talent for a while uh, and, and, and being the caretaker of this talent. One of the things yeah. I love that you're doing is that you're sharing what you know, yeah, which I think is very important. What, yeah. what are you doing to, to help uh, bring up the next person so that they get a chance yeah. to hold it as well? Right. But, but, and right. so that's an important aspect. But totally. what is, does Thomas Fluarty have a swan song? Is there something special that you want to do with your talent? Um, I'm okay. So again, I, I don't mean this to sound arrogant. I'm kind of already doing it. Um, and and what I mean by that is, um, I'm doing like somebody said. What are you going to do when you retire? I'm like, I'm not going to retire. I, I love no. what I do, right? And I and I, I feel like I'm already retired. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. And so I, I have like a, a mantra or a, uh, a creed and it's create, engage and, and edify. And edify sounds arrogant. Like I will now edify you. That's not at all what I mean. <laughs> what I mean is I'm gonna create what I want, what I love and that joy and that excitement and that pressing into that create creation, that creativity or that, that peace if there's joy infused in it and, and, and there, there's, there's something about creating happy, when you create happy stuff and you're happy, it's infused into this piece and it strikes people and it touches people. So create, and then when I create, I'm going to post it. I'm going to engage people. And then when I engage people, I'm gonna say something helpful. 
that's the three things. That's the three, that's the threefold like creed of my life. It's create, engage, and and build up basically. You know what? That, this Breathe is life. There's an interesting thing. I remember when I was in a science class, this is going back way like yonder, right? When yeah, uh, and and our science teacher told us that a rainbow does not exist. Wow. And, and I and it was like, well, wait a minute, well, you can see it exists. No, he said, what's happening is that you have you have your sun. And the sunlight is going through something like a raindrop and it's creating yeah. a refraction. Yeah. He said, um, what exists is the raindrop and what exists is the sun wow. going through the raindrop and being yeah. refracted. Wow. But a rainbow only exists when you have a third point that is able to perceive it because it, now you need another fixed position in order to see the separation of the colors. Wow. You need a third point. And that's kind of like what we do with our art, where we can be like the sun and uh, in, in that we create an uh, artwork and the artwork can be the raindrop with the refraction going through it, creating the sunlight. But you need that other person, you need a, an audience to yeah. draw for because they become involved in, yeah. uh, in this triangular relationship between you yeah. creating this, creating this joy and then, and then them perceiving that joy and being affected by it, and then, and then, yeah. there's, there's something symbiotic about about that 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 triang triangular relationship. Yeah, that yeah, art, that's that's good. That makes the art complete. Is that is that how you would define a successful drawing? Is that what you're looking for? That's a tricky thing. Like, what is a successful drawing? Because perfectionism sucks, really. Yeah. And perfectionism sucks the life out of a piece. And so th this is a conversation I've been having with Todd Casey, a, a dear friend of mine and uh, a, an amazing painter. Uh, he schooled, he schooled at uh, GCA, uh, Grand Central Academy in New York with Jacob <laughs> Collins. And there's this whole scientific side of art. And it's, 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 it's good to be trained classically. So, but, but when things become so cerebral, pieces are technically correct and good. Well, good's a difficult term. They're, 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 they're technically correct, but there's no life in them. So when you have intuitive ability and you don't have as much classical education, that power of that is alive. And so, my goal is to wed both of them together because I have, I can't tell you how much crap I've seen because of the scientific checkbox. I did everything right. I got all my values controlled. All of my form is rounded and blah, blah. And it just sucks. There's nothing yeah. about that piece that moves anybody. Yeah. So I'm taking that education that I now have and I'm bringing in intuitive uh, ability into it and I'm wedding the, Two together and that to me is a successful drawing do you know what i'm saying yeah that's a successful drawing yeah you know and i have to say this that both, most artists are afraid of failure and exactly. i think that's their, their biggest problem and yeah. and that actually was one of the questions i had for you is that i see that that you enjoy building flaws into your work uh and most most uh, artists are are so fearful uh of these flaws yeah. And but you actually build that it, it's sort of this idea of of building failure as even part of the, of the drawing, and that's your fearless nature in in tackling yeah. the drawings. And I I saw you you talking about your process. I watched the video, and you'll start with a blind contour, yeah, yeah. which automatically is flawed. And yeah. then you start <laughs> from that premise, and then yeah. where the proportions are distorted. Yeah. Uh, and so it's starting from the flaw and then trying to trying to draw your way out of it. And I thought, like, not only is that really challenging, but the result yeah. is is incredible. It's beautiful to see that struggle. It, it really is kind of a yeah. spiritual struggle when you think about it, that that you start with the flaw and then you work your way out of that flaw as a, as opposed to the emphasis being in perfection. In a way, yeah. it's, it's a very Let personal ask, approach, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting, I never thought of it that way. Why would you say that it starts in flaw? Like what, 
what uh, what's present in in to to classify it as a as a flaw because you you'd have to compare it to something. So what what's the yeah. opposite? What's the opposite way? If you didn't do a blind contour, what's the non-flawed way? The, Just the, so I understand what you're saying. The academic way, right? Which is yeah. that they would sit there, draw at all the angles, get everything, draw yeah. the skull. The yeah, floor, yeah, yeah. You know, with everything, everything yeah. where it is, and you measure it, and then right. you start to draw yeah. into it. Only then. I, yeah, I understand. Everything is perfect. And then, but, but yep. you are so fearless. It, it's sort of like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to start from here, from my gut. Yeah, right, right, it's gut. Right. And then and then you start from, from this contour. Dude. And and then, because that that is also, it's another way of perception. There isn't just one way of doing it, which is this right. academic way. Absolutely. No, you're, you're, you're so fearless in saying like, no, I, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna start from that structure. I'm not gonna rely on that yeah. crutch. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna rely on on my, my gut instinct uh, yeah, yeah. for, for the, these shapes. And then, yeah. and, and you do launch into that. That's interesting. So, um, I've never seen you draw personally, but your drawings have a power about them. John Navarre is, is, is probably, I think, uh, I, I'd say, I think it's safe to say, I think he's the greatest draftsman alive today. That guy can freaking draw. I mean, draw. he can draw. And with John, it's just like, He's just like you said, he's just freaking monster. He's just like, right? And, and I think that, so what I've come to conclude is I don't want to be scientific. I want to, I want to know that and have that shape me, but I'm not going to do an egg shape and, and let that define me. I'm going to build this thing as it moves across the face, goes over the nose to the left eye, comes down the nose, down the filter, into the lips, down to the chin. And I'm going to build this thing sort of free to, freely with freedom. But I also know the structure of the skull because I've studied it. Yeah. So there's all this stuff firing off at the same time. Do you know what I'm saying? And your way of drawing, though, and, and, and mine is the same way. It, we draw differently. I think you have the fractal method. It's, it's not that you woke up one day and said, I'm going to draw with the fractal method. It's like, I never woke up and said, I'm going to draw with a blind contour, not really. I never, yeah. ever did that. I just, when I started breaking it down and understanding it and actually teaching, I realized, wow, I'm not even looking at my paper. I, I never look at my paper only to put my pencil in the right place. And then I look back at the subject and I move my eye and I move my pencil and I, I stop back reposition it i'm never looking at my paper and the weird thing about it is this little kid was watching me draw a couple of weeks ago and he goes you're not looking at your paper <laughs> it, it was like it was like this confirmation of like that's really bizarre but yeah. maybe that maybe that is and i'll say this this is really interesting as well so i've taught this before right i, I do these workshops and uh i have people practice blind contour uh, for 30 minutes. And as I walk around the room and I look at blind con all their blind contour drawings, they're the most beautiful lines I've ever seen. And I look at them and I say, if you took this drawing home and you showed your spouse and you said, I paid 600 bucks for this workshop, they'd say, are you nuts? Because the drawing yeah. doesn't look like anything, but yeah. the lines are so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, absolutely. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and there's something, uh, I know that when I first started out uh, as a student, I, I tried really hard. I just wanted to, to be successful at what I did. And I tried really hard. And I actually tried too hard. Um, and the, uh, there was a teacher that uh, he had my sketchbook and he started flipping through my sketchbook. And uh, his name is Everett Peck. He just passed away. Uh, I, I know who he is. Yeah. Last week he passed away. Unbelievable oh. talent. Wonderful talent. Totally. Amazing. Uh, yeah. He was, he, he was a great artist and a great teacher, but an even better human being. Beautiful. And, and oh, he, love said, it. He, he was holding my sketchbook in his hands. And he said to me that uh, he said, you know, your sketchbook should never be painful to work in. Wow. And it, was, and it was such a, yeah. such a beautiful, almost freeing thing that he said to me, he yeah. said, it should be, the, he said, your sketchbook should be, uh, it's a, it's a place where you can go and practice. It's a place where you can share your secrets 
and it should be your best friend. Uh, Dude, that's that awesome. Me, that to me just blew my mind. And I remember that it was because I was proud of my sketchbook. You know, I yeah, I, yeah. I had that <laughs> right. Part, like my sketchbook is like the best sketchbook, right? These right. beautiful, beautiful drawings in there. Yeah. And when he said that to me, wow. it was like somebody just threw a cold glass of water, a refreshing cold yeah. glass of water yeah. in my face, my face okay. because it it made me realize that I had missed the entire purpose of a sketchbook. And then I started thinking about the importance of like, no, I'm supposed to be taking chances. Uh, if I'm not taking chances here, where will I take chances? Yeah, right. This, totally. this is my friend, my confidant That's that I, I can tell my secrets to. That's that I, excellent. I can, I can whisper to, to this. I don't know how to draw hands. <laughs> That's awesome. And draw hands. That's great. Or, or uh, you want to practice like, I don't know how to do pen and ink. And this is the secret you whisper yeah. in sketchbook. That's and, and fantastic. You draw, and and you draw this out. Uh, and I was thinking that's like- Money, man. That's total money, dude. That's awesome. That's incredible. And that's, and that's a blessing to have had a teacher like Everett Peck. Um, how, how do you see your sketchbook? How, how, how do you see that? Okay. Yeah, uh, it is. It's, I'd say you actually uh, put to words- what needs to be heard uh, because I don't think there's any other truth other than what you just said. That's exactly what it is. And I think if we can accept, I think I may have said this in a post, uh, nobody's hitting home runs all the time. And if you can just embrace that, that's freeing. That's, that's totally freeing because what we're playing around, we're playing games and put a, put a, put a lens on it, put, yeah. I'm only going to post my, my great things. And I, first of all, Peter in the Bible, he failed and Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom. So, so the dude that blew it the most understands failure. He understands brokenness. That's the guy I want to talk to, right? It's like, I don't want to talk to the guy that thinks he's got it all together. He's arrogant. But it's the person that struggles. It's it's when and that's what that's what sketchbooks are is their struggles, and they're actually uh, they're freeing. So like, I just did. I just came to this conclusion. I did these. Um, so I've got a lot of half baked sketches in here, and I've posted them from time to time. And I when I'm honest, people respond a lot to that honesty. And right now. Um, I, st I tried to do a drawing the other day, uh, just yesterday, and it just sucked. It didn't, it, didn't, it didn't have the taste that I wanted and I was going after. So I went back to my sketchbook and I said, man, this was cool. And so I was like, I don't know if you can see this. I was like, I was like let me see here. I was, like, I was like, this drawing is cool. And I want to do this when I uh, go to the actual original. And I was like... If I could just do that. And the reason why I did that is because I wasn't really trying. Yeah. You see what I mean? So I'm, I'm, I'm getting convinced that my best art, my best drawings is when I'm not trying. Yeah. And so it sounds so cliche. I don't mean it that way. I'm trying. Yeah. But when I try, I suck. Yeah. Oh, I, I, the worst I thing you not try. Do. The worst thing you can do, and this is what I found, like uh, when I'm doing all my figure drawings, the worst thing I could do is sort of like, and it never, it was without fail. I'm drawing, I'm in the zone, and I grab a nice fancy sheet of paper, right? Like a like a four dollars, five dollars yeah. sheet of paper, and Dude, I put totally, it up. Yeah. I'm thinking like, oh, this is going to be a good one. I might as well <laughs> sign it now. <laughs> and that's like that the kiss. Hard. Right, because as soon as you do that, you you uh, you have already put an expectation there. Now you are no longer in the zone, and that drawing is doomed. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I heard I heard Carter Goodrich say he gets nervous when uh, he feels like he needs to perform or do something at a certain level. So he kind of kind of said it like, you know, I'm home. I'm at my house. I, you know, I don't know if he yeah. drinks coffee, but it's almost like this is a sacred moment. This is this is something that's freaking awesome. I'm not doing it to post. Screw yeah. that. I'm just doing it to have uh, this juice flow, this this magical moment of discovery with no. I actually have my note a note here: a joyful disengagement from motive. That's what I'm trying to do 
a joyful disengagement from any motive. And if I can create out of that, man, I have a good chance of making something really cool. But that's tricky. But what I'm getting at is when Carter's creating, and he's freaking brilliant at his designs, but I don't know what his sketchbook looks like. I don't know what Peter DeSev's sketchbook looks like. To me, it doesn't even matter. But here's, here's another thing I'll say. I, I, I go, I study with Joe Paquette, who's an amazing painter. And I know somebody else studied with another painter. And he was saying that when he did this workshop with this other guy, this guy was really sucking wind. And I said, this is really cool. He wasn't saying it to be mean to the artist. He said, it was cool because this guy is such a rock star that he was choking on this demo. And I said, dude, that's the coolest thing that could happen is to watch a pro choke. Yeah. And the reason why is because it's hard. This is freaking hard. Yeah, it's hard. And, and so I was at a workshop with Joe Paquette. He's doing a demo and he's, he's, getting, he's getting his butt handed to him because the lighting sucks. The lighting's changing and everybody's talking. And at one point, Joe says, hey, guys, can you just be quiet? I need to figure this out. And we all we all shut up and we just watched him. And he was struggling. And what I mean by that is not to bring him down. It's to say that was one of the most helpful demos I ever saw because I got to see him pull it off yeah. and he freaking pulled it off. But he struggled through that thing. And that struggle is so cool. So you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's just like. Yes, this is what it is. You know, what's interesting is that when I when I go to the museum, uh, I, I love seeing artwork. I love going to the museum. Uh, and I, I went with uh, Ian Dorian and we were we were looking at a Picasso and, and it was just beautiful. We're just soaking it up and talking about all the composition. And then I got really close to it and I started looking at it from the side because yeah. I wanted to see where the corrections were. Oh, wow. I wanted to see where the paint was different, where... Yeah made the adjustments because sometimes when we see the artwork it's like oh all we see is the magic all yeah. we see is the totally. illusion totally. and but i wanted to see the struggle i wanted and then yeah. we notice look 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 he moved the that there's a slightly different color paint on the eye he wow. moved the eye and you could see the outline of the eye like what it used to be before That's and you could incredible. see the difference that he had yeah. and, and that was it when you start seeing all of these adjustments like Look, the hand used to be here and he moved yeah, it. Yeah, I've seen those. I've and when you them. see that, you start realizing why did he move it? Why did he move the hand? Right. And seeing that struggle is a lot more, uh, it's a lot more valuable to us as artists than it is just opening up a book and seeing the artwork because you don't get to yeah. see that. When you see the artwork in person, seeing the struggle, it, it's not that we yeah. want to see the struggle because we want to see some poor soul being tortured. Right, but no, no, artwork, no, right. We, we want to see the triumph, which is yeah. we're looking at the triumph, yeah. and we want to see the decisions that led there. Because, the, right. like you said, what we're doing is hard. There's no easy way to figure this stuff out. It just yeah. kind of comes out of somebody's. Oh, and there it is. Like, no, there's <laughs> going to be in every drawing and everything. There are decisions that all kind of That's lead right. up, like a chain of decisions yeah. that it takes yeah. to your destination. And you could see where that was even happening for somebody like Picasso. Yeah, it reminds me, this, this is so true. I love the decisions. It's, it's all these decisions. One of the things that comes to my mind, and I think you may know this, may, I've said this before, I've heard it, it's, it's true. The little, the little kid uh, uh, sees a uh, caterpillar in the, uh, in the little cocoon and the caterpillar busts his wing out and he's trying to get out. And, uh, 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 and, and all of a sudden he gets one wing out, but he, he can't get out. He's trying to get his head out. And the little kid runs over, grabs the cocoon and opens it up. And the butterfly dies because the butterfly needs the struggle to build its muscles, to get out of that thing, to be able to fly. Yeah. Isn't so that like interesting? The whole, the whole struggle bu is building muscles so that thing can freaking take off. If, if you eliminate the struggle and you think you're going to help it, it ain't going to work. And that thing's going to die. And I'm just saying that's built into creation. That, that's, that's mind boggling. But the struggles are what makes you, you. And it sounds so cliche, but if, I, I'm, I if I'm anything of knowing anything, all the years of being jerked around and struggling, you know what I mean? It's the struggle. Yeah, and, and there's, there's something really comforting. And, and a lot of it is like, you know, we, we struggle when we're trying to do this finished piece or something. But in, in, uh, but in a, 
in a sketchbook, it's a little different. Yeah. You know, we, we have a struggle. There's still a struggle that's taking place yeah. as, as we struggle to work something out. That's great. But it's a, but it's a private struggle. That's great. It's, it's a struggle where, uh, again, it's where we work some of these decisions out. It's our best friend. It's our confidant. It's the person that we're sharing these, yeah. you know, this, you know, our, our secrets with our, our private great. struggles or insecurities. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that, that is such an important uh, aspect in, in how that sketchbook works. And one of the things I, I realized was that when, that we do our best work when we're comfortable and how right. we're comfortable. Yeah. How we're comfortable is, is different for different artists. Yeah. That, uh, how did you learn to draw? And I remember that when I was a kid, I used to take paper and I used to put it on the back of this book. And it was a flat book that I had. Yeah. And I would draw on that. And I would draw the cartoon characters as I watched them on television. Uh, and, and that was it. And it's a clipboard. And still today, you know, I, yeah. I draw on a clipboard because it, I, I just am very comfortable with that. And, and I'll draw sometimes with a ballpoint pen uh, yeah. or, or with a pencil. But I, I noticed that that that's really when I, when I'm most comfortable. And I really do believe that, that the sketchbook, if, if an artist isn't at that point with their sketchbook, they, they need to find uh, uh, that, that thing that helps them. What, what is it? Is it drawing? Is it drawing on your sketchbook on a, on a sofa couch? Is it drawing yeah, in yeah, your yeah. bed? Is it drawing right. on the floor? You know, yeah. find that place where you're yeah. comfortable and you can relax because th that's what right. you need. You need to relax yeah. in order yeah. to start seeing things a little bit more clearly. That's fantastic insight. Um, I never really thought about it. It's almost like, because you, you said something even before that, uh, that's actually so true. You should put these down in a book, uh, some sort of something. We're, because, we're doing it now. <laughs> yeah, but these are fantastic thoughts that you're having because... It's almost like, thanks, Ben. Um, it's almost like, this is my wife, real quick. I know you. This is Marcelo. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good to see you. I remember meeting you. Yeah. Hi. It's good to see you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I hope yeah. he's not driving you nuts. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, Mr. Pell, you bought him? Yeah. Um, w w one of the things that you said that's so cool, it's like, it's a... It's a place for you to fail. It's a place for you to make mistakes. It's a, it's a place for you to experiment. It, it's, like, it's like you're off the record. You know, like it's almost like you, I should write on my uh, sketchbook to remind me off, off the record, you know, because I shouldn't, I want to have a joyful disengagement from motive as much as possible. And that's tricky. But that sketchbook might really be that if we can adjust our thinking and maybe maybe we have to think differently about our sketchbook. And I think having this conversation with you, you're allowing me to think differently about my sketchbook, which is really interesting. Yeah, I think this is wonderful. I, I think uh, a lot of young people could benefit greatly from uh, reintroducing themselves to uh, the sketchbook because I uh, I, I think a lot of them are probably working in uh, in a digital media. They're they're working on Procreate. They're working on their uh, on their iPad uh, or, or their tablet. And uh, what do you think? What do you think about that? Uh, people working digitally, and uh, what is is there an advantage uh, in working analog? What, what do you see there? Well, it's a tool. That's all it is. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's just simply a tool. It's like Hey, you know what? You shouldn't draw with a Sharpie. You should draw with a Pentel. It's just a freaking tool. That's, at, that's it at the end of the day. My advice to um, uh, an artist is to say, um, I would draw traditionally as much as possible. I can't convince a 20 something year old to do that. Yeah. What I'm thinking at though is I'm thinking about it uh, from a monetary side point yeah. of view there's something about drag you drag a pencil across paper i don't care i don't care how you make your your apple uh you know your ipad feel 
it, it's not the same. It's not. And there's something about texture. There's something about the smell of a piece of paper. It's a sensual is the wrong word, but it is a, it's an organic, it's an experience. It's like, yeah, it, it, this is, um, it's touch, it's smell, it's everything, it's sight, it's, you know, it's engagement. Because like, when I think of your work, that actually is something that I think about. Because uh, I love this drawing that you had done of these, uh, these women at a beauty pageant. And uh, the oh, yeah. winner was crowned and she, her, her face is sort of twisted in, in sort of this, this happy shame, grief uh, celebration. And, and it's, it's so visceral that it, 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 it transcends the medium of it just being pencil. And, and we're just uh, completely uh, enveloped in that moment along with them. Yeah. And it's so wonderful to, to see uh, you do that. And, it, it, and it's tactile, you know, that, that, yeah. that you, you drew this thing out. And in the same way that the same emotion that you were able to capture uh, of that moment, there's also an emotional uh, relationship that you have with the surface of the paper. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so here's another thing. If you want to build chops, do a move on your canvas like that. You can't command Z that. Yeah. You can't command that, Z that. That is That's so easy. Command Z's kick. You make a mark that counts and it has to count or you're screwed. Man, that changes the game. That that that's a whole different um, that's a whole different um, muscle you're exercising. Yeah. yeah. So it's, I'm not knocking digital. I use it all the time. I yeah. use it all the time. But I, I and I've used it for a long time. And I and I mean, anytime I do a cover for the Washington Examiner or or whatever, I'm always doing that. But I draw traditionally, scan it in, and paint on top of it just because I also want to be able to sell an actual original. So I'm also thinking monetarily that I could sell this thing. Yeah. You can't sell a digital print. I'm sorry. I mean, I do sell prints in my store yeah. of my original, but I sell that original. Don't get me wrong. I definitely yeah. sell that original. So I'm thinking, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, the way I, I phrase it is that uh, when you're working analog, that it is a, that you have to be deliberate and it teaches you to be deliberate. Yeah. Whereas I, when you're working digital, uh, you, you can always back up, go command Z and then yeah. retry something. And there isn't that commitment. And that, yeah. uh, and that's the advantage that, that you're, you're actually training that muscle. You're, you're yeah. the muscle to be deliberate, the, the muscle to make decisions. That's good. I that, like that. That you don't get when you're working digital. And again, look, I, I work almost primarily digital now when I'm uh, professionally, but sure. when I'm got to be on my own, uh, I, I love to work analog because you make, you know, we get, we've gotten used to making decisions. Uh, I have, I know we're coming to the end here. So I, I uh, want to talk about one of the things I love that you do is that, that you share what you know, you share your knowledge. Uh, you you teach drawing and painting online with uh, uh, with schoolism at uh, with Bobby Chu. Um, uh, talk a, this is your chance to plug a little bit about that and uh, uh, yeah, just to, and to talk about your philosophy. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so I teach online at schoolism. That's really and I have uh, three three classes. I have a painting class there. I have. Uh, uh, a, a drawing fundamentals class, which I'm getting ready to redo. I'm actually working on it now. I'm re it's 10, it's 12 years old. It dropped in 2010. So it's, it's now 12 years old. I'm re I'm redoing that, that class. That'll be a brand new class, new homework. It, just a whole new experience. If you've taken the class before, this would be a brand new one. And so a lot of people start with the fundamentals. Uh, it's like five weeks and it's only like $500. So most of the classes are a grand. This is 500 and it's just five straight weeks. It's cool. Um, then I have a, 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 the 901 Indigo Blue class, which is extreme. It's, it's all of my thinking uh, packed from how I'm drawing now and, and how, I, how I'm creating uh, with caricature, exaggeration, form, value. Uh, it's classical education meets exaggeration. So that's, that's the 901 Indigo Blue class. 
And then I'm also on Patreon, uh, which I just went on uh, two months ago. And Patreon allows you to follow me in my studio for, uh, I think, $12 a month. You can you can follow and I do behind the scenes stuff. I'll put put up videos and I'm drawing. Um, uh, I, do, I do critiques, not, not so much critiques, but um, group critiques where we're drawing the same photo and then uh, and then I look at their work and I and I uh, do it like a group critique. It's it's really cool. But all of that is to say, hey, if if you like what you see here, you can follow me. Uh, you can go take my actual class on schoolism. So basically, on schoolism, you can you can subscribe and watch all these amazing artists. Like there's some unbelievable. I, I don't know. You have a class in there? You, you you're. Uh, I don't yeah, have a class. Yeah, you have a class. I've done I've done uh, various lectures. Or yeah. Hobby. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I mean, dude. <laughs> you, 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 40 years of knowledge and skill and extreme skill so that's what schoolism is it's so cool but anyways patreon just started i'm starting my third month and i give away a drawing to a, a certain person so i'll just send i've got tons of sketches i just send out so yeah. it's it's pretty dang cool so yeah so anyways yeah that's that's sort of what's happening and uh other than that i'm just posting and trying to be helpful that's my main thing yeah. is i I just want to share something to help people along this incredibly tough journey, you know? Yeah. And I will say That's this, so it doesn't suck. It doesn't suck to be an artist. I don't hate my work. I actually really love my work. And yeah. that sounds arrogant to say, but it has nothing to do with arrogance. I've created so much crap, so much stinkers, so many half-baked things, but I'm creating now at a level that I'm like, I dig this. And if I dig it and I put it up, it might not get as many likes as I thought. And I'm like, what the heck? Yeah. Then I might put something up that maybe isn't what I thought was great. And it gets a ton of likes. I have no way of knowing, yeah. right? There's no way to gauge. The main thing, draw what I love, draw what you love. People will love it because if, if it's emotionally connecting with you, it will emotionally connect with others. And that's all stories are. Stories are right emotionally resonant stories draw emotionally resonant drawings let them radiate emotion that's the idea and yeah. and like you said the um the um the miss america is one of my favorite series and to, i noticed something and i gotta say something so that's what i'm saying for me yeah. if 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 i can say something and see something and then say it and try to communicate it that's usually yeah. the best pieces for me that, that yeah happens. and I, and another thing i've noticed is that that you love drawing these crusty cowboys. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I looked at that and I thought, there's so many different materials in there. And I think that's part yeah. of what, what you really like. There's the, there's the leathery skin, there's yeah. the felt hat, there's the, there's the bushy mustache, yeah. there's, <laughs> there's the, the, the wool coat, there's the tin star. Dude, totally. <laughs> Oh my gosh, there's all the, it's like a sampling of <laughs> delicious textures that, that, you, that you've put into, into this, it's kind of like a chef. We were talking about that earlier about like That's great. having taste for That's things, great. That's that excellent. you're like a chef and, and you're, you're coordinating the usage of all these different flavors and spices. That's great, I love it. It's just beautiful, beautiful drawing. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Of these different textures. Dude, that's totally it. So it's again, it's like, I think I said in my cowboy book, I was like, who made up this cowboy world? Like who decided that we're going to have this? We're going to put a star right here. We're going to have gloves with little frilly things on it. I'm going to have a vest and it's going to have a uh, cowhide on it. I'm also going to do a little like a uh, thing here that I'm going to, you know, like who, who comes up with that stuff? Like, I honestly don't know. Yeah. It's just, it's so crazy. So when I see it, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is nuts. But I'll say this too, the whole reason for Cowboys is I actually, I wanted to work on character design and I wanted, I just found them fascinating. Yeah. So I'm just continuously practicing character design, refining and thinking about shapes and there's shapes all over. So again, it's serving me. I'm not just doing it for a like, I'm yeah. fascinated by this world, but even on top of it all, you can monetize Cowboys. So yeah. it's this weird thing, you know? You yeah. can't monetize Miss America necessarily. That aspect is important now yeah, because it, we're we're artists. We it is a business. Absolutely. You have to find a way, like like you did when you were talking about uh, 
learning to pull back just a little bit on those caricatures for that particular clientele. It's yeah. finding the right market, finding yeah. the best way to communicate yeah. some of these ideas oh. and, and communicating to a market. And it goes back to that rainbow idea where, you know, we, we can create the artwork. You have the artist and the artwork, yeah. but you need an audience to, be, to become part of that yeah. relationship. And that once you figured that out, that, be, that became such a crucial you know, aspect to your success. Uh, and it just, it, you know, and, and to hear you talking about the, the commercialization of some of that, which is you got to draw from here. It has to matter That's to right. you, yeah. but there's also a way that, that, that you can make that viable uh, so that you can continue to provide for your family. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. And that's that's really what my books are all about. It's because people are interested. They want they want to collect my drawings and I put them into a book yeah. and I sell them. I get them made and I sell them and then I'll go to a show or a convention and I'll sell them. I have stuff to sell. So I'm selling them regularly pretty much all over the world. It's pretty yeah. crazy. And the one thing I'll say real quick and you can edit these things out. Sorry, but. I did the cowboy book and I struck a nerve because there's a gigantic cowboy uh, world. But I realized I went down to Dallas to a uh, Red Steagle cowboy show, cow cowboy gathering. And I took like, you know, I don't know, 500 books. And I took a bunch of my cowboy drawings. I thought I was going to crush it because I'm now in cowboy land. Yeah. These cowboys laughed at my work. They loved it. They thought it was hilarious. They've seen that guy before. They know this guy. They didn't buy but five to 10 books. That was it. Yeah. And people, the way I made money, because I realized I needed to connect it to people that know art. It's not just cowboys, go to cowboys. It's cowboys and people that know art. So that was a huge learning thing for me. I have to know who my client base is, yeah. who's interested. So that was, that was very interesting. That was a, that was a huge uh, uh, sort of like um, a eureka moment where I just like, I understand now. So Lightbox is a great example. People are showing up there. They love art. They love what you do. They want to meet you. They want to buy your stuff. Yeah. You got to be in the right place, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to chat with me about the, the sketchbook. So and uh, I am so appreciative uh, of, of this, this opportunity where Same. you know I, I feel so lucky because I, I get a chance to talk to you know the, the people who I, I really appreciate in the industry and, wow. and uh, talk about some of these crazy ideas. Because like you're saying, some of it, uh, you know, some of it may seem a little hokey, you know, to, to be passionate yeah. about such things, anything yeah. from a sketchbook to uh, the pencil, to uh, drawing different textures. Yeah. Um, but but yeah. when we're amongst ourselves, we talk about these things, you know, it, it's important. And, and it's something, yeah. you know, we, we've, we've actually revolved our lives around this stuff. And there's kids out there that, you know, there yeah. might be some, a young person out there that, that's uh, looking to get into the business and they feel like an outsider because yeah. they, they like drawing these textures. They, they like drawing uh, uh, funny things. They, they want to communicate with their audience and talk to them about something, how they see the world, how they perceive the world. And yeah. to know that that is exactly what we're doing on our end. And that yeah. those are the things that we're looking for. And those are the things that are important, I, I think can be transformative for their lives, can be transformative for their, their professional careers. Yeah. And I, I can't thank you enough for, uh, uh, for, you know, just, you know, kicking these ideas around with me. Dude, it's, it's, it's a huge honor. Uh, I, I, I don't know you extremely well, but I, I've, I've always been a fan uh, of you as an artist, but especially as, as a man as well. Uh, and so I'm honored when, when I knew you were going to want to chat. Uh, I know at the top of it all, it's to be helpful. That's the yeah. bottom line. We're not here to talk about, I mean, you've done tons of high profile stuff and you're, 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 you're a rock star in that world for sure. But you're not here to talk about yourself and I'm not here to talk about myself. I'm here to talk about what we love, you know, yeah. and it's ultimately what we love. And it's the, it's people listening that they love the same thing. Yeah. And we're just simply delighting in the coolness and the gift of art. That's basically yeah. it. Right. Yeah. Well, take care. Thank you so much, Thomas. Yeah, God absolutely. bless you. And uh, Thanks, I hope to talk to you soon. Appreciate it, Marcelo. Thanks, right. buddy.